So I met Benny in the fall of 1992. I was a young legal aid lawyer right out of law school, and she was my first client, a homeless teenager, and together we were at Covenant House, which is the largest shelter for homeless teenagers in New York City. I didn't know it then, but more than two decades later, I lead Covenant House, and we work each year with more than 50,000 homeless and trafficked young people across 28 cities in six countries. Why did I decide to work with homeless teenagers? I don't know, hard wiring, I suppose, marinated by parents who healed injustice and injury with love. I think I met Atticus Finch at just the right time in my life, even though To Kill a Mockingbird is a work of fiction. It's the truest story that I've ever read, and an instinct for the underdog, and homeless, unaccompanied teenagers are the planet's preeminent underdogs. So, back to Covenant House. Here, Benny and I were, and I couldn't even tell you what color her eyes were for the first half hour. She was cradling herself, and she was rocking back and forth. She averted her gaze to the floor, and she told me that she never knew her father, that she lost her mother when she was almost 13 years old. She was turned over to her mother's sister, who disenrolled her from school and made her a domestic slave. So she was responsible for all the cooking and all the cleaning in that house, and she couldn't leave. When she was 15 years old, she was turned over to a gang, the Crips, and she was serially raped through her adolescence. She broke free when she was 17 years old, and she made her way to JFK Airport, where she forged for food out of the trash cans. A couple of Port Authority cops saw that this kid was eating trash out of a trash can, and they asked her what was up. She told a bit of her story, and they brought her to Covenant House. She had a lot of legal issues. Her aunt had run up over $150,000 of consumer debt in Benny's name, and she was hopelessly behind in school. I mean, she could barely read, and there was no clear path for her back into school. We found our way together. Over the course of that year, she began to learn to read. Her sadness ebbed a bit, and her legal issues one by one got resolved. My work and her life took us in different directions. I saw her three years later at a, at a restaurant right by the shelter. She's wearing a bright blue waitress uniform and a white apron. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? What's going on? She says, I've met a boy who loves me in the right way. I love that. And then she says to me that she's putting herself through nursing school. I was astounded. Nursing school? She said that she wants to work in a neonatal unit. I couldn't believe it. How does someone go from never knowing her father, losing her mother as a 13-year-old, being betrayed by her family, forging for food out of a trash can, finding her way to a big homeless shelter in New York City, and then within three years decide to give her life to help other women's sick children get better? I don't mean that rhetorically. How does that happen? That question never left me. To hear Benny tell it, she started to listen to a new symphony, a music that was compiled by new voices that encouraged her to believe in herself, to accept herself, to own her future. You know, in our young brains, when all we hear are the voices of disenfranchisement or marginalization, you're not enough, you don't fit in, you don't belong, you failed, you're a freak, you're weird, you're a geek, all those voices conspire together to be one voice, our own voice. All the different timbers and pitches and resonances, they just come together. And it's what we tell ourselves is the story of our lives. Benny needed a new story. She needed one that would carry her forward into the fullness of the life ahead of her, unshackled from the one behind her. And this is the first essential thing that home must do. Home must be a place where kids are unconditionally loved and accepted. I don't mean that sentimentally. I mean it has to be a place where kids feel good about themselves. It doesn't happen casually. It happens only when we come together and decide to make a house a home. This is what we tried to do for Tony. He was adopted as an infant by a couple whose marriage quickly devolved into allegations of drug abuse and violence. Those folks made his life a terror. He doesn't remember a lot of hugs. What Tony remembers is fists. He remembers flinching and reeling and hiding. It was too much for his mother, and she left that house and did not return. Tony was almost 13 years old. And so, a 
Afraid of that house without her, Tony also left and began a downward spiral. He had been the star quarterback of his eighth grade Pop Warner football team. He'd been a straight A student and with no time at all, he was a drug user. He was a truant and then a dropout and he was a homeless teenager living on the streets of Anchorage, Alaska, ricocheting from alley to group home to shelter to friend's couch and all along he felt worse and worse about himself. Which is no surprise because all of the research teaches us over and over again that no experience has a more dramatic impact on our development than rejection by a parent, especially in childhood. And Tony felt rejected. He was alone on those streets of Anchorage, Alaska for six and a half years. Could have died. But did he die? No, he did not. In fact, he is here today. Within a few years of his lowest teen moment, Tony became the lightweight boxing champion of Alaska. And today, he is happily married and a doting father. And two nights ago, he was mentoring homeless kids at the shelter in New York City. So what happened? Well, a lot happened. But the first thing that happened is that Tony was surrounded with voices and faces and people in a home, a new home, who gave him absolute respect. And he started to respect himself. Tony needed, like Benny, a new story to carry him forward. And I don't mean absolute respect in a sentimental way. I mean the kids have to know that it's OK to fall down and get back up again without shame or judgment. Life isn't baseball, three strikes and you're out. Home is go back to the plate and keep swinging. You're safe. You're home. Life isn't about vo avoiding falling down. Life is about the art of rising up again. Life is about resilience, and Tony saw in this new collection of voices, voices that didn't echo shame or judgment, but voices that kept saying, you can, you're enough, you're special, you're extraordinary. Tony saw an opportunity to pick himself up again and apply himself to the art of boxing and to excel. This is what young people need. They need to be unshackled from judgment and shame. And this is how kids emerge. Whether it is from the shackles of physical homelessness or the shackles of emotional homelessness. That's the journey for 15-year-old Maggie. Now, most folks wouldn't even say Maggie's homeless. She lives here in Monmouth County. She is a high school freshman. And she lives in a loving family. She has a roof over her head, and unlike Tony and Benny, she has always had a bed to rest on. But last year, Maggie slipped into a depression, the fog of despair that each year strikes so many girls in this country. Last year alone, 2.8 million young people between the ages of 12 and 18 were diagnosed with depression. Girls were three times as likely as boys to be diagnosed. Yeah, Maggie had a roof over her head, but she felt so disconnected from everybody under that roof. She was paralyzed, she was terrified by the fog, by the clouds, and her parents missed or misread all of the signs for the typical signs of adolescence. Staring off in the middle distance, withdrawal, tearfulness, irritability. What changed for Maggie? What changed for Maggie was validation. So many young people in this country are lost every single year to depression and suicide because depression is missed or misdiagnosed. Kids feel invalidated. They feel lost. They feel hopeless. Validation changes it up. In this way, Maggie and her family are the lucky ones. A long road to recovery began last year for Maggie. And she is, in this way, on her way, on her way to a, a future of hope and opportunity. But it began with her family and her treatment team not saying to her, chin up, don't cry, don't worry about it, don't let them get you down. Because she was down, because they were getting her down, because she was feeling tearful. Instead, her family acknowledged and validated her fear, her terror, her anxiety. And the more that her family validated, the more connected to them she became. Society puts so much pressure on parents and coaches and grandparents and mentors and teachers to have all the answers. 
to be the fixers. It's unrealistic, it sets us up for failure, and it invalidates kids. Our invitation as adults who love kids isn't to have all the answers, it's to be company, it's to be encouraging, it's to set boundaries and structure and to be loving. It is not to shame, it is not to instantly fix. Validation is the key. And this doesn't simply happen because kids have a roof over their heads. This requires more than a house, it requires a home. A home that provides absolute respect, unconditional love and validation. Now of course, all of you already do this. Close your eyes for a moment. No, I mean it, really, close your eyes for a moment. <clears throat> now think about all of the children and the grandchildren, the younger siblings, the nieces and the nephews who stand taller and who rise up in love because you are in their lives. Think of the kids on the stages at their band concerts or the kids on the basketball courts looking out for you to see if you are there. The kids who run to the door to hug your leg because you are in their lives. The kids who run faster, who sprint, who strive, who aspire, who reach, who shine because you are in their lives. Now open your eyes. If I could fill this room with the faces of all the young people who are the better for what you have been in their lives, we would be overwhelmed by the power of this room to heal. We would be undone by our ability to move the planet. I say this to you not because I want you to leave self-satisfied and feel really good about yourselves. I say this to you because I'm begging you to tap into the power that is already within you to reach out to that next group of kids who don't have home, who don't know unconditional love or absolute respect or validation. For all the kids out there who languish in foster care, who bounce from group home to residential treatment center and who have no sense of family other than strobe flashes of maternal and paternal love. For the kids who can't find community at home so they look on the streets for it in gangs. For all the young people getting bought and sold. For young people who are sinking down the rabbit hole of despair and depression because of their undiagnosed anxiety and depression. For all the young hearts who need our old hearts to tell them, you are enough, you are beautiful, all will be well. I ask you to come together and make home possible for them. This, my friends, is how the world gets to be a better place. And I know this to be truth from more than two decades of learning from and loving kids. I know this to be true because home is the scaffolding of my life. And this is more, my friends, than just about how do you make a home. This is about how do we make hope? How do we fill the planet with hope? How are we oxygen for kids and helium for their dreams? And I know this because Tony is my friend And Maggie is my daughter. Thank you. <laughs>